Welcome to this month's Francis Humphrey Lecture Series from the museum, the Nevada State Museum. Uh, we were actually just talking this morning about how we would have half in-person, half Zoom uh, lectures, hopefully in the future. Um, anyway, today uh, we're lucky to have uh, Glenn Wharton, who is currently a member of the Nevada State Prison Preservation Society. Uh, but before that, he had a 32-year career with the Department of Corrections here in Nevada. So not only did he, he live that history, he, uh, you know, now he's studying it. <laughs> um, so a great guy, a local here in Carson City, uh, working hard to make sure that the story of the Nevada State Prison is told. Um, and... I'm looking forward to listening to that story here today and, and maybe even setting up some tours of the prison with him so we can see it in person, right? So I have to, of course, you all know, now switch the camera so that it's on Glenn. And there he is. There he is. Okay. And of course, I'm letting people in because we still have people coming. All right, so um, can you see this little box here? That's you in the screen. If you can maybe scoot a little forward. There we go. There okay. is Glenn in all his glory. Let's see if this works. You know, I, I was actually pretty comfortable about coming here tonight until I saw the people that were signing up. These are. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, these are like some ghosts out of my past, yes. and uh, <laughs> there's some expertise in this mob here, too. Huh? Anyway, we're going to talk tonight about the Nevada State Prison, and, it, and it, I know it's kind of an odd topic, uh, and a lot of people uh, think about prisons, and, and uh, they have their perceptions through the media and the, the movies and, and what goes on out there, but the reality is that it's really an interesting place. Um, we took Myron Friedman through. And uh, My Myron made a comment that I use all the time and Myron said that, uh, you know, this is just, you know, it's not just prison history. This is Nevada history because it, NSP, and that's what we're going to call it for the rest of the lecture, NSP uh, is so integrated into the politics of, of uh, the state and uh, you know, it's had such uh, interesting um, incidents take place out there and some really interesting personalities. So uh, we're going to go ahead and try our clicker here yeah, and I'm see. Trying. So hold on a moment because I need to make sure they can see the slides. Okay. And I'm having some challenges making sure. PowerPoint's always a lot of fun. All right, everyone, you have to tell me if you can see the slides. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. Yes, I can see it. All right. See it. Looks good. Okay, then uh, there we go. I think we're ready, ready to, to roll. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Is your button not working? Button's not working. Okay, let me try it. Oh, this happened last time where I was. Oops. Ah, there we, oh, go. there we go. Okay, that's, that's our initial shot. So anyway, most of you will recall, and obviously, um, with your attendance and who's out there, uh, you know Nevada history. In 1861, uh, the Territorial Legislature met at the Warm Springs Hotel, um, just to the east of town here. And uh, at least the, the myth, at least among us prison people, is that uh, during the course of the Territorial Legislature, uh, there was a political discussion one evening uh, that was fueled by alcohol. <laughs> it, mm -hmm. it turned into a rather violent uh, discussion, uh, and the next morning, the owner of the hotel presented the, uh, the legislature with a bill. He was also a, a, a delegate uh, that I'm sure you all know, uh, Abe Curry. And, of course, the legislature had no money to pay for the damages, so they came to an agreement uh, wherein they um, leased a portion of the property uh, effective on January 1st, 1862, as a territorial prison. And they made uh, Abe the first warden. He was the first, he was the warden of the territorial prison. Um, obviously, 
just before statehood, uh, the territory purchased um, a portion of the property for $80,000 in bonds. Now, that sounds like a lot of money, uh, especially back in uh, 1862, but uh, the reality is the bonds weren't really worth all that much money. Um, but uh, with statehood, uh, NSP converted from uh, a territorial prison to a state prison. Uh, in fact, uh, it was uh, written into the state's constitution. And as such, it's the only agency in state government that uh, is in the constitution. And, and a byproduct of that is that uh, the prisons are basically administered a little differently than other state agencies. Uh, they have their own administrative regulations that are approved by the Board of Prison Commissioners. Um, and uh, they, although they give um, credence to the Nevada Administrative Code, they still have their own uh, procedures that they, uh, they follow. As part of that um, conversion to a state prison, they uh, made the lieutenant governor of the state the warden, the ex officio warden, uh, and that was because they had no money to pay a lieutenant governor, so they found a way to give him a salary. And uh, that uh, really wasn't the best means of managing an institution. I think we're having a little difficulty again. Hold on. There we go. There's Abe. I'm sure you've all seen photos of him over time. 1867, there was a fire on the property, uh, and it... Um, destroyed a lot of the, the wooden portion of the institution. In 1870, there was a large fire, uh, and that was suspected arson by a couple of inmates. Uh, but they really, at that point, began to focus on the stone construction. And uh, that um, began this kind of um, uh, incremental development of the property. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that... Uh, we obtained uh, as a result of taking over that property was uh, the remainder of the old Warm Springs Hotel. On, if you look at those old photographs of Warm Springs, uh, you'll see that right over the, uh, the main entrance, there was this um, carved eagle. And that eagle over time, he, uh, he moved to the Odd Fellows Hall down here on Main Street, Carson City. And when they demolished that building uh, to make way for the Nugget, uh, it migrated to the um, Eagles Hall on Fifth Street. Uh, a couple of years ago, they were disestablished their chapter and they called us up, the uh, Preservation Society, and they um, offered the Eagle to us and we were able to, but the, the trick was we only had two days to move it. And uh, it's rather heavy and it was inside the building and with the cooperation of the uh, Railroad Museum and the Department of uh, Corrections, we were able to move it down the street in a uh, uh, off pallet jack onto a uh, uh, front loader and drive it down Fifth Street to the prison. Unfortunately, somebody has uh, in their wisdom in the past painted up to look like an eagle rather than leave it in its um, uh, original state. Uh, but we do have that. Bob, I know you and Gina Torrey came out and uh, looked at it for us and authenticated it. So uh, anyway, moving on in 1871, September 17th, uh, 1871 uh, was a Sunday evening. And at that time, uh, Frank Denver was the Lieutenant Governor and thus he was the warden of the prison. Uh, and the Captain of the Guard was locking up the inmates for the evening. And somebody, uh, uh, one of the inmates hit him in the head with a uh, rock and a sock. And they uh, uh, pretty much knocked him out. They began to beat him. And one inmate grabbed him and threw him inside of a cell and slammed the door and basically saved his life. Now, the inmates uh, uh, broke through a wall in the prison and actually into the bedroom of um, Frank's daughter. And in that room were his daughter, his mother, and uh, his wife. And they screamed, obviously. And uh, Frank grabbed a pistol and went up the stairs, uh, shot one of the uh, inmates, and then they uh, overwhelmed him. And he was, he had his skull fractured. He was shot in the back with his own pistol. 
and uh, they continued on to break into the armory. Uh, they got in the armory, got the gun, started out, and a uh, young man, a guard by the name of Jeff Isaacs, was out here. If you look at this photograph, uh, he, he was out in front of this building, and uh, he started shooting. They fired back. He was shot in the thigh and went down. A couple of the other guards were wounded. Uh, Matt Pixley, who was the manager of the Warren Springs Hotel, it was still in operating operation at that point in time, he grabbed his pistol and he ran up to one of the windows and went to shove it in there to fire on the inmates. And one of them stuck a pistol out and shot him right in the eye and killed him instantly. Um, the inmates, obviously, by this time, when had, they were firing for cover and the, uh, uh, the staff were kind of out there in the open, so they had the advantage. They came out of the building and they started east towards the Carson River. There were 29 of them. Uh, when they got the river, they kind of broke up into different parties. And um, one of them, a small group, started south. And they went into Mono County uh, because their, um, I guess their erstwhile leader there uh, was familiar with the area. And um, on their way down there, they murdered a young Pony Express rider by the name of Billy Poor. And that obviously upset the locals. So they got together a posse and they went after uh, this group of uh, inmates and confronted them at a lake. And that lake is now named uh, Convict Lake um, in, uh, uh, for the confrontation that took place there. Um, the posse was ambushed by the inmates. Morrison, who was the leader of the ambush, was killed along with um, um, the um, guide, the Indian guide that they were using. Uh, they named the mountains around the lake after them and uh, these guys continued on their way. Uh, now the locals are really upset. They get another posse together and they capture three of the inmates. And um, as they were bringing them back to, um, uh, to town, uh, they were confronted by some vigilantes who took the two older inmates and they hung them out of hand and they let the 18 year old that was the third man, uh, he came back to the Nevada state prison. Um, anyway, that was a very notorious escape, uh, in our history and frankly, in the history of the West, that was a very notorious incident. So notorious in fact, that they actually made a movie that's kind of related to uh, the escape. Now it's got nothing to do with the Nevada state prison. Uh, but the um, men involved in this uh, were supposed to be the convicts that escaped from NSP. And I've got to tell you, it was a bad movie about bad men and bad women, <laughs> uh, despite the fact that they had some big names. And I mean, Glenn, Glenn Ford, Gene Tierney, uh, you know, if we're of an age, uh, we'll actually remember who those people are. So uh, kind of as a result of this escape, uh, they had uh, some political uh, fallout. Um, the legislature was obviously upset about this incident. And one of the difficulties they had uh, was that they couldn't hold the warden really accountable for uh, his lack of supervision of the institutions uh, because he was elected. So they basically passed a law that appointed a warden. Uh, but there we go. But uh, Frank, Frank Denver, uh, you know, this was his mail ticket and he refused to um, allow the, uh, the new warden into the prison. He said it was his job and he was going to keep it. Uh, he wouldn't let the governor, the attorney general, or the secretary of state or the treasurer, anybody uh, come in. He basically blockaded him, locked himself inside the institution. Well, the governor at the time, Lewis Bradley, he, he, uh, after several weeks, he lost patience. And he wrote up an order calling for the militia in Virginia City to come down and deal with Frank Denver. So on March 14th, 1873, 60 militiamen and their cannon rolled up to the gate of NSP. And at that point, Frank uh, decided that, uh, you know, the better part of valor was to allow the change of uh, administration. So Frank departed. Uh, ultimately, he left office as lieutenant governor and died several years later, not too long after this, 
uh, in San Francisco. Now, typical of the state of Nevada, uh, in modern Nevada and uh, antique Nevada, so to speak, there is always um, concern over the cost of incarceration. So um, we had two very obvious um, industries, I guess you would say, out there at NSP. Uh, and the most obvious one was the quarry. Uh, the uh, property is actually, well, the property itself is a quarry. The prison was built uh, right in the middle of it. Um, so um, they used the native stone there to uh, construct their own uh, cells right out of the ground. Uh, the other thing that uh, was important back then was a shoe factory. This was a very political um, uh, issue uh, because number one, the uh, shoes that were being sold were being undersold in the free market. So that made merchants somewhat angry uh, about uh, this industry out of the prison. Uh, secondly, um, it never made a profit. Um, throughout its entire history, uh, people that purchased their shoes, uh, well, I say purchase, but the reality is they would take the shoes and not pay for them. And uh, so that became a problem. And, uh, uh, but the reality is, uh, although we, we know that the quarry is the most obvious uh, work that was available out there, the shoe factory was actually the, the larger industry. Um, that's what they did. You kind of get a view there of the, uh, the quarry. Uh, and that's what it looked like back in the 1880s. Uh, this was also uh, kind of the, uh, uh, the beginning of the Great Foss War. In early 1880s, as they were quarrying out there, uh, they began to find fossils and fossilized footprints uh, in a lot of them. Um, if you look at some of the old photographs, and there's a lot of these online, uh, you can see these things. And, and uh, some of the experts that came out from California, from the University of California down at Berkeley and whatnot, uh, got into a con uh, an argument over whether these were giant humans or something else. Uh, in this particular photograph, uh, you can look at these footprints. And if you look closely right about the middle of the screen there, you'll see a pair of shoes so that you kind of get an idea of the scale. Uh, but this controversy continued uh, actually in to the early 1900s when the footprints were identified as those of a giant sloth. Um, now in 1893, Nevada was invited to contribute um, a display to the Columbian Exposition in, in Chicago. Uh, now this invitation came relatively late. So they were scrambling hard to find a uh, uh, appropriate items to put on display for Nevada. So they decided uh, because there were so many people coming out to the prison to look at the footprints and the fossils that they would dig up the uh, footprints and take them to Chicago. This is a photograph of Y.A. or J.A. Earrington uh, and an inmate uh, digging up uh, the footprints. Uh, and Mr. Earrington was actually the individual responsible for putting together Nevada's displays. Um, and these um, footprints went to Chicago, they came back, and they're now in the Keck Museum up at uh, uh, the University, Mackey School of Mines. Uh, I guess it's not the Mackey School of Mines anymore, though. I'm, I'm not sure. You can tell I'm an old alumni. So, um, it's still the cat. Is it? <laughs> and um, anyway, through the, uh, uh, through the late uh, uh, 1800s and the early 1900s, uh, there were literally thousands of individuals that came out to the prison uh, to look at those, um, those footprints. Uh, and if you look in the old newspapers, you see where uh, groups of scouts and ladies organizations and, and uh, influential tourists and whatnot uh, came out to the institution. Um, getting into some of the darker history of the prison, um, in 1901, uh, well, let's go back in 1901, uh, 
the state passed a law uh, that moved executions from the counties uh, to the Nevada State Prison. Uh, prior to that, uh, it was responsibility of the um, local sheriffs to conduct executions. But in 1901, the legislature um, wondered about the suitability of having public executions. So they moved them to NSP. They had their first execution in 1905. And uh, the method of execution at that time was hanging. Uh, and that basically continued until um, 1910, or actually 1911, that slide is incorrect. Um, in 1911, the legislature passed a bill that allowed the inmate to make a selection of the method of execution between hanging and a firing squad. <laughs> now, uh, coincidentally, the next person to be executed was an individual named Andres Amerkovich, and he was convicted in central Nevada for the murder of, an, of, of basically his attorney uh, in a dispute over a will uh, of his cousin. Uh, he didn't get as much money as he thought he should. So he was sentenced to death and he opted to be hung or be shot. Um, now, uh, and in fact, he asked, uh, as he was on the train coming up to Carson City, he asked the uh, sheriff at the time, um, Joe Malley to shoot him on the train, <laughs> but they brought him up here and they, they tried to put together a, uh, an, a, a firing squad and the warden at the time, by the name of George Cohen, uh, could not get uh, enough volunteers. And, and uh, if, if he tried to uh, order people to participate in the firing squad, they'd quit. So he resigned. And uh, at that point, they um, appointed Denver Dickerson as the warden of the prison. Now, Denver uh, was the former acting attorney or acting governor uh, of the state. And he, uh, he served from 1908 to 1911. So here he is trying to figure out how to execute Merkovich uh, without having his entire staff quit. So uh, he had a, I guess you'd say an execution machine built uh, that had three rifles. Uh, and uh, basically it was a blind shot. So whoever was involved in, in activating a weapon did not know whether he was the one who actually fired the weapon or not. And, uh, with that, he was able to carry out the execution. Um, now, uh, he did, that was the only instance of a firing squad at NSP and the, uh, the executions by hangings uh, basically continued until 1921. Uh, at that point in time, the legislature passed a law that said that the means of execution would be uh, lethal gas. Um, there were two individuals convicted out of Hawthorne, two uh, Ch young Chinese men uh, who were convicted of killing uh, an elderly merchant, Chinese merchant there. Um, and basically they were in a tong and they were trying to extort money from the Chinese merchants. Um, uh, G. John uh, did not get in a... Uh, uh, commutation of his sentence. His co-defendant did, a young, uh, a younger man, uh, but uh, G. John was the first individual to be executed uh, with the gas. Uh, it was a little bit difficult. This had never been done before. Uh, G. John was the first person in the United States uh, and probably in the world that we're aware of that was executed in a deliberate uh, singular fashion. Of course, gas was used in World War I uh, to a large extent, but this was, this was a little different. Um, uh, basically, what they did uh, is they um, took the butcher shop and they sealed the windows uh, and they tested the cyanide that they had to purchase down in Los Angeles. They tested the cyanide on a cat. And then at that point, uh, they put G in there and uh, use the gas to execute him. Um, you can, s there were, there were quite a number of observers there. They had people from California law enforcement uh, and they also had observers from the, uh, uh, from the army. Uh, after the execution, uh, Dickerson 
reported to the legislature that he thought uh, that the state ought to get rid of executions by gas. He thought it was dangerous and complicated, but uh, in that particular effort, he uh, failed. So um, here we are <laughs> with our clicker again. It's being stubborn. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I will. Okay. There we go. So, anyway, in in, uh, in the 1920s, uh, late 1920s, they built a separate purpose-built uh, gas chamber at the end of uh, the cell house, and then uh, in 1948-49, when they made an addition on uh, the third floor. Uh, onto the administrative area. Uh, they had a purpose-built gas chamber up there, and this is what it looked like. It had two chairs, and had this Marine-style door on the back. And uh, actually, uh, they had uh, 32 executions by gas out there at NSP. And the last one was in October of 1979. Uh, some of you again, of an age, will remember Jesse Bishop and a lot of the controversy that attended that, uh, that execution. Um, after Jesse's execution, <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the back door, the seal on the back door of that uh, gas chamber was hard as a rock. And um, there were some discussions about being able to exit that, that uh, execution suite. Uh, if there was a leak, and then and the director at the time, a guy named Chuck Wolf, uh, was really not impressed with that. So he made a, re a request, a bill draft, uh, that the means of execution be changed to lethal injection. Uh, so they did that. And since that point in time, uh, there were 11 executions uh, using lethal injection carried out at NSP, and the last was in 2006. Uh, now, despite the fact that NSP closed in 2012 because the state had no other suitable area for an execution, it remained the location for executions if uh, one would be uh, attempted or carried out. And uh, as a result of that, our organization, as we went through and uh, try to work and, and develop access to the institution, we were excluded from that area for several years until they uh, had the new chamber built at Ely. Um, some of the other dark or unusual things that occur out there, the most obvious ones are escapes. Uh, the most notorious one beyond the, uh, the escape of 1871 was a guy named Leonard Fristo. This is Leonard uh, there on the left in December of 1923 when he uh, was admitted to NSP for uh, murdering uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. He was actually, he actually came into the department in 1920, uh, and he uh, was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole for murdering two sheriff's deputies. This was a bad man. And kind of, kind of to give you an idea of the uh, experience level of the wardens at the time, uh, a mere three years later, uh, Leonard is the warden's chauffeur. And on December 15th, 1923, uh, the warden had Leonard drive him and two other inmates up to Reno. And uh, the warden had Leonard drop him off at a house of ill repute <laughs> and let the other two inmates go take care of some personal business in Reno and they would meet back at a later time. <laughs> now you can you can imagine Leonard's response. You know he he's in there. I'm out here. I have a car, a life in prison, and this. Okay, let me put this thing in gear, and we're out of here. So Leonard goes off to Mexico, and then he travels book back up into Texas. At some point, when he was in Texas, uh, he shot uh, his boss on a, on an oil rig in a dispute over uh, over his salary. And then uh, he got away with that one. They, they didn't catch him, uh, but he got into the hotel business. He ran a hotel and, and uh, then 
finally he uh, he got into ranching and retired uh had a whole family and and um, 1969 uh in orange county california a young woman who had just been married uh, calls the uh, orange county sheriff and says you need to come to my house and deal with my father in law this crazy old man is threatening me and so they get there and uh they they walk up to the door and leonard goes you got me <laughs> i'm gonna escape you from nevada state prison so he he was on escape from december 1923 until november of 1969 a mere 45 years and 11 months now that if you look in the guinness book of records it's the longest escape in american history with a recapture so back leonard comes he, uh, he winds up here at nsp um there's uh, Sergeant Hoffer uh, taking Leonard uh, from the administration area and he's going to walk him back to the ID area to get his mug shots. Um, he remained in prison until uh, the next year when his case appeared before the pardons board. The pardons board voted to release uh, Leonard, but I'll tell you it was not a unanimous vote. This was a bad man. Uh, and, uh, you know, he had, he had returned uh, to prison because he was threatening uh, his uh, young daughter-in-law. So that's one curious escape out of there. That's not the only one, but we don't have time to go into all of them. Uh, so we'll, we'll mention this one. Uh, uh, this was in May of 1982. Um, and out of the maintenance area at NSP, obviously the maintenance supervisors weren't paying a lot of attention to what was going on out there because the inmates were trying to build a little helicopter and uh, they uh, they made the frame of the helicopter if you look close there it's uh, the frame is made out of uh, metal from stacking chairs and the engine is a uh, 350 honda motorcycle engine and uh, i don't know what they were they or what they were going to use for blades uh, but uh, you know, I, I had a little experience with helicopters, so they asked me to go look at it. And um, if that thing had ever started up, somebody was going to die. Because, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, in, in the service, you know, we, our definition of a helicopter was thousands of moving parts flying close formation. Yeah. And uh, uh, it just wasn't going to go anywhere. But it was, it was an interesting effort. Um, the most visible uh, uh, element of the Nevada State Prison for most people is, is the stone that was quarried out of there. Now, obviously the Warm Springs Hotel, uh, there we go, the Warm Springs Hotel, that's dressed stone, uh, ready to go. Uh, Warm Springs Hotel was constructed with the stone right there on the site, as well as the um, um, first, the Great Basin Hotel, which ultimately became Orangeburg County's first courthouse. It was constructed in 1862. Um, 1864, we had both um, the Myers Hardware Company and on the back side of it, we had the Warren Engine Company, the United Net Methodist Church, and uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier in the, in, uh, the 1870s, we began the uh, incremental construction of the stone portion of NSP. Uh, 1870, the building uh, that we're sitting in here tonight uh, was prison stone. And um, as you may recall, um, Abe Curry was uh, instrumental in that and also in managing the, the men after it was uh, open. 1871, the following year, was the capital. 1873, Abe Curry was also the construction superintendent on the VNT uh, maintenance building. Now, the impetus for the uh, development of the Nevada State Prison Preservation Society is the VNT maintenance uh, building, and that is because, uh, as we're all aware, the VNT wound up being uh, a rock fence at, at a California winery, uh, which is so sad. And uh, uh, Myron Carpenter, uh, former teacher here in, in, in Douglas County and, and around the area, um, got together a group of us to uh, put together an effort to preserve NSP so that it would not go the way of, of uh, uh, 
the maintenance area. Um, some of the uh, others there that aren't quite so obvious, the state printing office uh, was built in 1875. And one of the really cool things that uh, uh, they've done is that building is actually integrated uh, into the state library and archives building uh, here in Carson. Uh, also the old armory uh, is still in existence um, uh, just across the street from the um, Supreme Court. And it's basically used for storage. There's not a lot going on in that building, but it's still there and, and it's actually in pretty good shape. Um, the old orphan's home uh, for the state uh, on that property uh, on Fifth Street uh, was built using prison stone, uh, as well as the foundation of the governor's house. Now, you know, that's not the only uh, house in the historic portion of Carson City that that uh, profited by uh, NSP stone. Uh, they have the Stuart Nye House, which is uh, built entirely of prison stone, the Curry House. Uh, and there's there's obviously others over there. You can, you can go over there and walk the blue line and you can see those uh, uh, evidence of that stone. Uh, also is the uh, Heroes Memorial Building on the left and the uh, old Orange County Courthouse, which is now part of the uh, Nevada Attorney General's office. They have their moot courts over there now. 1920 to 1925, uh, there was a lot, uh, there was this ongoing effort to finance and build uh, a cell house at the prison. So this is the result of that uh, pretty much five years of work. And uh, uh, on the left side there, that two-story uh, area, that was basically a service area as it goes towards the corner there on the second floor of that two-story area. That was the mess hall. Um, and... Uh, if you look to the right of the cell house there, you see that hole on the bluff there, that kind of cave uh, that's been dug. And that's the location of uh, those hundreds of fossilized footprints that uh, that they talked about. Uh, unfortunately, the entrance to that has been covered uh, by a large slab of cement. And uh, uh, that area was filled in uh, as... Um, it was opened up at one point and um, the, the uh, public works board decided that the uh, Department of Corrections was going to compromise the foundation of the tag plant license plate factory that was built on that bluff. Uh, 1948, uh, they constructed an addition onto the cell house. It looks almost identical, except you can tell that the stone is cut in a little different way. So you can see the old and the new. Uh, coming away kind of towards you there on the right hand side of the photograph uh, is uh, kind of a general area for storage, storage and whatnot. And uh, remember that because we're going to talk about that location uh, in just a little while. Um, these are a, a couple of uh, constructions that you're not going to see much. Um, Back in the 18, uh, in late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, the state purchased a ranch um, out near Stewart. And uh, in 1924, they built a ranch house on that property. And I have to tell you, you know, as, you know I worked there for 32 years. <clears throat> I didn't know that house was out there <laughs> until uh, after I started working on the preservation. So uh, it's, it's just not really um, accessible and it's not in really good shape either. Uh, they don't use that obviously for inmates or staff anymore. Uh, in 1953, Warden Art Bernard uh, decided that uh, uh, he would build some cottages for officers and their family. Uh, and basically what this did, this gave them, uh, they, they paid a de minimis uh, a minimal rent, uh, but these people were available uh, during incidents after hours. So, uh, uh, and actually when I started working there in uh, 1973, when I started working there in 1973, uh, there were still officers living uh, in those cottages. Um, 
1960, 63, um, they built, uh, if you look on the left-hand side there, that's maximum security uh, wing. And that is where uh, we kept the, uh, the worst of the worst. Uh, these were individuals that were uh, basically pending the death penalty. And people that uh, were extreme escape risk, people that were uh, very much prone to violence, even though they were in prison. Uh, you know, a lot of people get, get confused about the nomenclature that we use in prisons. They, they, they talk about maximum security or maximum custody. And when they talk about security, what they are talking about are the physical features of a prison, you know, the, the walls, the bars, uh, if you look there, the towers, the fences, you know, those are the security. The custody is the amount of supervision that an individual receives. So, you know, at a place like NSP, you will have inmates in this maximum security prison, but they're actually at medium custody. So uh, the maximum security guys, they're going to be in this, this new building from 1963. And the medium custody guys, the guys can get out on the yard, go to work. Um, they can go to the mess hall and, and get fed. They're, they're medium custody and their supervision is not nearly so extreme. Um, this opened in 1963. Uh, prior to that, um, if you got into trouble and you were placed in isolation, you were literally placed in the hole. And on the right is the hole. <laughs> and the last time that uh, that area was used uh, to segregate an inmate who misbehaved uh, was 1963. Uh, so when we do tours, we're going to be going to the hole as well. So you can look forward to that. One of the other activities, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, there was a further construction out there at NSP, but uh, it's not nearly so interesting. This uh, was done in the 1980s, and these were supposedly a modern concept in corrections. And I have to tell you, they are absolutely the worst correctional design I have ever seen uh, anywhere. Uh, they are uh, extremely difficult to supervise. Uh, there's got a huge number of blind spots. Um, you know, they, uh, their construction created this corridor uh, where uh, staff, if they were in there walking in that area with inmates, they were, they were literally hemmed in. And about two weeks after we opened this area, we had a couple of officers almost killed in that area uh, down in the tunnel there leading up. And as a result, they uh, built that ad hoc sort of a uh, walk uh, ramp up there on top where we could put armed officers. But anyway, we don't, we don't go up there too much. Uh, uh, we did work on a movie up in that area, uh, but that's probably not going to be an element of our tours in the future because frankly, it's not that interesting. So, moving along. Take a rest here for a moment. Yeah, technical difficulties. Oh, oh, there we are. That's good. One of the other activities out there that you may be aware of uh, is the fact that uh, for many, many years, your uh, the license plates for your vehicles were uh, made at the Nevada State Prison. Um, that uh, picture on the left uh, is a photograph. Actually, I'll tell you, and Bru, you, <laughs> you and I were talking about this photograph. Uh, this is actually a screenshot from a movie, movie called State Penitentiary, and it was filmed at the Nevada State Prison in 1949. Um, as that, uh, Bru, as, as as we talked about whether or not this was real, uh, as that in the movie, as that officer in the middle of the picture is walking into that area, uh, the camera shoots out of those windows and you can see the cell house in the background. So that was the original uh, license plate factory for the state. 
uh, it was photographed in that in that movie. On the right, you see the uh, the uh, one that was used up until very recently up there on the bluff. And as I indicated, that continued in operation uh, several years after the closing of NSP. Uh, here we go. This is unique <laughs> in correctional history in the United States. In 1932, uh, the legislature legalized gambling in the state of Nevada. So, Warden Penrose at the time decided that, golly, if it's legal, it's legal. So we'll just have our own little casino here in, in, the, in NSP. I remember I asked you to look at that building earlier when we were looking at that 1948 construction. And that um, casino was actually housed in that building. If you look at this photograph, you can see the card tables. The, uh, and there was a, uh, you can see a uh, 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 crafts table there in the background. Uh, and uh, basically the, the, the existence of this, this casino, basically talks to the experience level of the wardens. Uh, they, yeah, on, on several occasions, they, uh, they mentioned in the media that, uh, wow, these are, the, these are the cleanest games in the state. Who in the world would cheat in a prison casino? You know, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. But I mean, the, the, the administrators of wardens provided the space. Uh, the inmates owned the game, and they basically paid a rent to the administration. So, uh, and th they basically uh, they continued in operation. Uh, you know, with this underground economy, you could probably look at again those of us of an age. Well, look at that picture and go, "Wow, there's Joe. Joe owned one of the games." That's the, the building where um, the casino exists. This is a photograph from 1956, 56, during a sit-down strike at the prison. Uh, the, the other interesting thing about this maybe is if you look in the background there, uh, the, with just above the officer on the right, they're highway patrolmen, by the way. Um, that's a bleachers set up for the... Uh, prison baseball team. They were very active during this period, and they were basically the team to beat in the area. They were tough. And uh, But uh, getting back to the casinos, um, in 1967, uh, NSP got their first real professional prison warden, a guy by the name of Carl Hawker. Now, Carl had retired from the state of California as the yard captain captain of um, not Folsom. Jeez, I hate getting old. How about you, Sam? Are you old? <laughs> um, anyway, um, over there in Marin. And he was a tough little guy. And he came into NSP and he looked at that and went, are you people crazy? And so he decided to get rid of the, of the underground economy and the, the extortion and the, and the games that went on uh, behind all that. So uh, as he went to close that, he developed some opposition from the legislature of all places. So rather than get into a, to a big contest with them, he simply went to the gaming control board and said, wow, do you have a license for this thing? And of course they didn't. And that was the end of the casino. One of the things that's interesting about the casino and that makes, makes it notorious and notable uh, is the fact that uh, NSP used brass coins as money. And the use of these brass coins really facilitated the operation of the casino. Uh, and you can go online on eBay these days and you can type in Nevada State Prison and what will pop up there is uh, some folks selling these um, these coins. A set of these coins will probably go for about eight nine hundred dollars, so they're not cheap, uh, and uh, they're very collectible. You know, uh, Carl was uh, one of those interesting kind of kind of guys, wardens, but he wasn't obviously our uh, our only interesting warden. 
uh, Abe Curry, our first, uh, he was an amazing guy. He was essentially the founder of Carson City. He ran a hotel. Um, he was a construction superintendent. That's pretty much what he did most of the time. The warden, the mint director. Uh, I mean, he was a remarkable individual and uh, uh, came from New York to California and then and then into Nevada. Uh, we also had Bob, or uh, well, Bob Hallen, Robert Hallen. Uh, Bob was uh, the second warden and he was a very close friend of Mark Twain. Uh, if you read Roughing It, you'll note that uh, 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 Mark Twain spent a winter in a, in a cabin over in the uh, over in Northern California here across the line and that cabin actually belonged to Bob and they were lifelong friends Bob moved back uh, back to uh, back east along as, as did Mark Twain and if you go online you can read a multitude of letters uh, that they used to communicate with one another throughout their entire lives there's also some funny stories about Bob uh, there's one uh, that says that uh, uh, there was a newly arrived inmate in, at NSP, and uh, when it was time for him to come out and uh, go to work, he refused and uh, with a p appropriate prison language, said he wasn't coming out. And Bob went over to the blacksmith shop there on the grounds, um, got, a, got a bar of uh, steel and uh, put it in the flame there and heated it red hot and carried it back to the cell house and waited for it to cool a little bit so that the color went out. That didn't mean it wasn't hot. And so he poked that through there and the uh, inmate grabbed the bar and discovered uh, just exactly how hot it was. And Bob chased him around the cell in there with that bar until he decided he was ready to come out and go to work. So there's, there's other stories that you can get online and, and read about Bob and the and his association with NSP. Um, one of the, our other wardens, in fact, was uh, Frank Bell. And actually, Frank uh, was the warden from uh, 1983 to 1987. And then he had his second tenure there as, uh, pardon me? 18, 18, what did I say? 19, 1883 to 1887. Yeah, a long, long time. <laughs> and then he had a second tenure there of 1893 to 1896. Uh, the other thing interesting about uh, Frank is that he, uh, in addition to Denver, he was, uh, uh, Frank was also the acting governor of the state. And he was the governor from uh, September of 1990 to January of 1991. And I have to tell you, you, you know, <laughs> being being a warden of a prison today you know it, it's it's not the most appealing thing to most people you know um you know i again i worked for the prisons for 32 years and i would go home to my parents you know on, on occasion and my mother would go so you still work at the prison you know and uh but back in the uh, uh 1800s and the early 1900s uh, working at the prison was a very prestigious um, activity. Uh, becoming a warden was an extremely political activity. Uh, at one point, the wardens, including Frank Bell here, uh, were elected by the legislature. Uh, they would combine the uh, Senate and the uh, Assembly, and they would vote on who would be um, warden. So it wasn't you know, how qualified as an individual or anything. It was how much political pool they had in order to feed at the public trough. And they would go in, these wardens would go in and they'd fire everybody and then hire their friends so that they could join the feast at the public trough. And that went on for a long time. There was even, there was even a proposal uh, in the legislature at one point to have the warden elected by statewide vote in the same way as the governor and lieutenant governor and all. And, and I mean, that's, that's just outrageous when you think about um, the, the kinds of experience needed to, uh, uh, to run these things. Um, our next example here is Raymond Bacon, now, uh, Baker. Now, now Ray uh, became the warden because he was the brother of the, of the attorney general. His younger brother was AG. 
and Ray was kind of a, uh, he was interesting because he was kind of a reformer and he actually started using inmates in road camps and they worked on developing the highway between Carson City and Reno. And uh, they, they worked on both ends all the way from, uh, from Lakeview up here just north of town all the way into, in, uh, towards Reno. Uh, unfortunately, Ray didn't know anything about selecting inmates for that kind of a job. Kind of like, uh, kind of like the warden who uh, made Leonard Fristo his, his chauffeur. So they had inmates running all over the place out there. And as a result, Ray did not last too long. Uh, but um, being politically connected, you know, he, he, uh, he did not fall on hard times. Uh, he became um, director of the U.S. Mint. Uh, and at one point, he was the executive secretary, the ambassador to Russia. Uh, and he also uh, was, was kind of a uh, ladies' man. He married very well, uh, very rich women. So uh, anyway, we've already talked about Denver a bit. Denver was a really interesting guy as well. I mean, he was a, he was a uh, uh, soldier. Uh, he was, a, I think it was a ma uh, sergeant major. Um, of volunteer cavalry uh, in the Spanish-American War. He was a newsman out at Ely, a legislator. Obviously, he became uh, the warden on two occasions, lieutenant governor, acting governor. <clears throat> and between the time uh, his, his warden positions here at NSP, he was uh, the inspector general uh, of the Federal Bureau of Prisons, which is basically uh, the position of director of the Bureau of Prisons now. So uh, he did fairly well. Uh, uh, actually, um, Denver died as warden in 1925 in the warden's house on the property. Story. Yeah. So uh, moving on to inmates a little bit. Uh, here we got Maury Preston. I'm Maury was an officer in the IWW. And those of you uh, uh, who took your college history will obviously remember the, the IWW, the Wobblies. Um, you remember that, Sam? You should know this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, um, Maury was out on a picket line uh, and they were demonstrating against uh, a restaurant owner who uh, had failed to pay one of the waitresses that he discharged and the restaurant owner came out and tried to shoot Maury and Maury having a pistol uh, decided to shoot back and uh, the restauranteur he missed Maury didn't and he killed him um, so uh, the local mine owners got together and they paid a bunch of people to per uh, perjure themselves and they railroaded uh, Maury and a friend of his by the name of Smith uh, into prison for murder. Uh, and Mr. Smith uh, actually at the time of the murder was at home having dinner with his family. And that's how bad it was. It was an extremely political uh, incident. Um, the mine owners were working very hard against organized labor. Um, and uh, actually at one point um, they, uh, uh, the local politicians uh, hoodwinked uh, the president into sending uh, the army into Goldfield. So, uh, and, and those labor troubles down there in Goldfield actually were the impetus for the creation of the state police. And uh, the warden was also the ex officio superintendent of the state police. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately, uh, Maury and Smith went to prison. Uh, he was, the, 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 the labor organization were so outraged by this uh, miscarriage of justice that uh, the Socialist Party of the United States nominated Maury for president, to run for president. And that, but he declined the nomination, as you probably guess, uh, for two reasons. Number one, uh, he was too young to be president. And number two, he did not want to offend the pardons board who were going to make a decision on whether or not he was going to get paroled. So uh, he did his time, got out, and almost immediately, uh, he was a uh, telephone and electrical lineman and almost immediately died falling off a pole uh, down in Los Angeles. There's a couple of uh, interesting characters. 
remember I mentioned uh, uh, Andres Amerkovic uh, had asked the sheriff, uh, Ed Malley, to shoot him on the train coming up to Nevada. Well, Ed, uh, ultimately uh, a, a political entrepreneur, uh, became state treasurer, and George Cole uh, became uh, the state comptroller. And between the two of them, over several years, they embezzled uh, $519,000, 300 and change uh, from the state. And basically what they were doing with this money is they were investing <clears throat> in mines uh, that came up dry, oil wells that came up dry. And uh, they basically did this through the offices of the Carson Valley Bank owned by George Wingfield. Interestingly, George Wingfield uh, also was the bondsman for these two. In other words, they had to be bonded in order to hold the positions with the state. They went and actually reported this embezzlement when things fell apart to George rather than going to the, the governor or the police. And I mean, that, that was George Wingfield during those, during those days. By the way, George is, George is the individual who paid for the uh, perjurers in, uh, in Maury Preston's trial. <laughs> so he's got a little connection to NSP as well. Um, anyway, that was, that was actually about, that $519,000 is about half of the state budget back in those years. Uh, in in the year that uh, in, that they were caught, uh, they were sentenced to four years uh, at NSP, and uh, they were actually released on parole in 1931, and then they were totally pardoned in 1935 by their political friends. Uh, both of them actually, at one point in their later careers, again had government jobs, which is unbelievable. Uh, so Ed became a realtor uh, uh, in the end and um, did a lot of work up at Lake Tahoe. Um, um, other uh, uh, significant inmate we had was uh, Will James. Uh, Will was a young man and uh, he was from Idaho and he came down to Nevada and developed an unnatural love for other people's cattle. So he wound up in prison. Uh, NSP, and while he was there, he discovered he had this talent for art. <clears throat> and he did drawings, he did some sculpture, uh, he got out, uh, he wrote stories, uh, they turned into books, which turned into movies. He became a screenwriter of some repute. Uh, he and his wife actually lived out in Washoe Valley, uh, but he was, he was very much a, uh, uh, an active individual in Hollywood. Um, Interesting thing, I was talking to mine before we started here, uh, as I was going back through some of the old newspapers from the 1940s, I discovered a story about another young inmate, a young man from Lovelock by the name of Buck Nimmy. And uh, if you go on eBay and type in Buck Nimmy, you'll see that there's some postcards of his for sale. And he actually discovered his talent for cowboy art uh, while he was uh, also in the Nevada State Prison. Um, uh, most of us know Joe Conforti. <laughs> Joe was um, um, uh, out there as an inmate. Uh, we had that photo of him earlier at the craps table, but uh, he wound up in the prison uh, trying to extort uh, the district attorney in Washoe County, Bill Raggio. Uh, of course, we all know who Mr. Raggio was, and uh, <laughs> that didn't work. And uh, so he wound up out in the prison. Uh, he was trying to extort uh, Bill to drop vagrancy charges against him in uh, Story County. So off he went to Brazil. Uh, her next inmate was an innocent man, aren't they all? They're all innocent. At least that's what they tell you. Uh, back in the 80s, uh, Tom Selleck, did a movie out at NSP. Uh, you can uh, uh, live stream that uh, that uh, movie for you. It's adequate. It's not a big deal, uh, but it's out there and it has some shots of NSP. The basic lesson there is: don't go to work in the prison laundry. Stay out of there. It's dangerous. But it's not really the only new movie that we've had made out there. Actually, one of the things that you will find. Uh, uh, 
about NSP is it's extremely visual and movie producers love it. Directors love it because it looks exactly what you think a prison is supposed to look like. Um, they've had, uh, we've had movies back there in the twenties and thirties. Uh, we had one, um, uh, Brew has been doing some work on this one called desperate trails. Um, that uh, Brew discovered does not exist anymore. It's one of those movies that's disappeared. Uh, he's looked everywhere for it, has been able to find it. Uh, but there was, uh, I mentioned uh, that one shot of the tag plant, uh, State Penitentiary, that starred Warner Baxter, uh, 1949, 1950. Uh, and actually that was the last picture that Warner made. Uh, you've got to be really of an age to remember Warner. Um, and uh, you, you might remember that he was the movie's first Zorro. Uh, and uh, after he made State Penitentiary, he underwent a frontal lobotomy for his migraine headaches. And of course that didn't work out well for him. Uh, another movie made out there was Death Watch. Um, that was um, uh, basically starring Mr. Spock, Leonard Nimoy. And, uh, uh, also a, a, a pretty bad movie that uh, that you can get a hold of and see some YouTube shots. Uh, uh, others were Flesh and Blood, uh, Black August, uh, and of course we uh, essentially supervised the production of uh, the movie The Mustang several years ago uh, out there at the present, and we did an episode of Ghost Adventures. Uh, where they were out there looking for uh, paranormal activity in the prison. And that is a big deal uh, that we receive uh, requests almost weekly for people to go out there and uh, look for paranormal um, uh, existence, I guess you'd say. Um, so that's the, uh, the rough outline of Nevada State Prison history. There's there's so many other things there. Like I said, there's incidents uh, that, that we don't have time for and personalities that, that can be expanded on. Um, and that's kind of what we're trying to bring through the Nevada State Prison Preservation Society. Uh, we've been existence in existence since late 2012, um, the same year that the prison closed. And we are, it looks like we are going to be able to get the institution open for tours. Uh, this spring, uh, hopefully when COVID-19 is under control and take people uh, through the institution and, and show them where some of these interesting, uh, interesting things occurred. Uh, we have worked uh, since 2012 uh, to get a change of use permit for the institution and we have received that uh, from the Division of Public Works. Uh, during that time, we had to obviously raise money. Uh, we had to deal with accessibility issues uh, for handicap ramps, people who had mobility uh, issues. Um, we had to um, construct um, handicap restrooms. Uh, we had to deal with lighting, um, fire safety on the doors, uh, all those kinds of issues. Uh, before we could get that change of use permit. But uh, we've settled that now. Um, later this month, uh, Brew has, uh, re well, as I say just recently, Brew has, <clears throat> has uh, he's essentially our pro project manager, and he has um, finished the project um, closing the leak uh, in the seam of the roof between the cell house and the maximum security unit. And later this month, he is beginning the project to remove the tile and do asbestos abatement in the visiting room. Now that room is going to be turned into our display area uh, and uh, we're gonna be uh, getting that all cleaned up and we're not quite sure how we're gonna do, do the <laughs> floor yet, uh, but we do know it's gonna be some form of uh, concrete uh, down there. Um, so, uh, where you can, if, you, if you're interested in joining us and, and we're gonna be looking for people to come out and become docents, I guess you would say. Um, 
when we have our tours, and that would involve training. Uh, we would teach you all about the institution. You do not have to be an individual who's worked at NSP or worked for the Department of Corrections. We very much welcome uh, uh, people from the community to come in and help us out. In fact, uh, the majority of our board are uh, community people. They are not prison people. And uh, what we found is that they they are the individuals that bring the, the real talent of uh, getting these things together because, you know, those of us who worked in prisons are very much in a, in a uh, uh, linear frame of mind. Uh, we have that hierarchy that we follow and the uh, the boss says jump and we say how high. And uh, so we're not used to dealing in this kind of uh, activity. I know it seems like a long time that it's taken to get this done, uh, but if you look at other examples of prisons that have been opened up to the public, well, this is a short time when you, when you compare it to say Eastern State Prison in Philadelphia or Alcatraz. Um, one of the advantages that we have here is that uh, number one, this is very visual, it's relatively compact, and it's accessible, unlike places like Deer Lodge and the, the Yuma, Arizona uh, stuff. You know, we, you, I mean that we've got that interstate running right by the right by the institution, we're easy to find. So again, if you'd like to join us, um, you can look on the internet, NevadaStatePrison.org, and uh, uh, you can find us. If not, you can give me a call. <laughs>
Uh, yes, the uh, when uh, Abe Curry was doing all that construction around town, uh, and the limestone was coming out of the or the sandstone was coming out of the uh, quarry at the prison. Did the state get any money for that material, or was it free for him? No, it, they they had to pay for it. Uh, okay. But, but, you know, we, they weren't making money on it. You know, they, the, uh, they were more active with the shoes. Um, uh, but, but, uh, you know, they would, they would pay for it. Uh, some of it was hauled on that little wooden track railroad, yeah. uh, up fifth street. Uh, you know, that one of the interesting stories about the rocks were, uh, the minister at the, uh, United Methodist church, he moved, he personally moved the rock, and then he personally built the church. <laughs> so yeah. he was a pretty active guy, pretty talented. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I have a, I have a question that was typed in the chat. Uh, it was talking about the Nevada State Mental Hospital in Sparks. Well, that's a really interesting uh, item. Uh, throughout the uh, 1880s, all the way up into the 1900s, there was this huge political fight to move the prison from Carson City to Reno. And they actually built walls for a prison uh, on property uh, to the east uh, of Reno. Now, my understanding is that is the property on which the mental health hospital is now located uh, I don't know, maybe Dale knows better than I. He's, he's got more uh, uh, contact with the mental health community than I have. <laughs> but uh, uh, that's, uh, that was a huge political issue. Um, Reno was always trying to take the prison, and Carson City was fighting them. And, uh, you know, uh, Reno would say, well, you've got the Capitol, and you've got the orphan's home. Why can't we have the... Why can't we have the prison? At one point, Elko threw their hat in the ring, and they wanted to have the prison. And, and uh, of course, uh, those of us who are alumni of the university, we know that we that school actually did start in Elko. So, uh, but yeah, uh, that was a big deal. I've actually found a photograph of those uh, constructed walls up there in Reno. Okay. Um, so uh, Dale is now uh, raising his hand. So Dale, you have to unmute yourself. Okay. Um, two questions. I, was the Gatling gun set up in case people tried to come and break people out? So it was kind of facing out? <clears throat> ah, you know, that, that, it, I'm, I'm not sure what their motivation was, but you know, one of the, one of the things that's funny about uh, uh, prisons is you have to consider uh, external threats as well as internal threats. More so today, obviously, than they had back then. Uh, I, I have not found a lot of instances. I, I tell you, for, for uh, entertainment during the COVID crisis here, <clears throat> I've gotten a, uh, a uh, subscription to newspapers.com, and I've started going through the old issues of uh, Carson Appeal, uh, Nevada State Journal, and Reno Gazette and starting back when they did. And I've been going through pulling out articles that relate to the prison, significant ones, not, you know, this guy went to prison or, or uh, the warden came to Reno or, you know, they did a lot of that back then. But uh, pulling all those out, I cannot find an instance where uh, anybody externally helped an inmate to the point where they would need to uh, use gunfire from the walls. Um, not not a lot. Only one. Only a, a lot of people don't know that uh, women were actually housed at uh, NSP as well until uh, the 1960s, and uh, there was only one woman that ever made an escape from NSP, and she managed to steal the purse and the coat from the warden's uh, uh, from <laughs> from the warden's wife and make her getaway. So, uh, you know that answer your question, Dale. Yes, I, I just I wanted to comment on the state hospital. I haven't had contact uh, with the old grounds up there since about 2005. So I don't know if they're still there. But up until that time, there were about four buildings along the uh, perimeter, kind of the north perimeter of the uh, old hospital, uh, which is would be now south of the new one. 
if it's still there, the rocks sure look like those quarried, you know, the buildings are made of those rocks that look like the quarried rocks from the prison. And there are some interesting uh, things on them, like they had hooks where they would hang people up that were wrapped in sheets and uh, spray them with cold ice water as one of their early treatments before they had the major tranquilizers. But enough for that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. People, people think that those of us who worked in prisons were tough. <laughs> but uh, um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, uh, you bring that up. When I was a kid, I, I, of course, Dale and I both grew up in Sparks and and went to school together. But um, when uh, Doctor Tillum ran the place out there. Um, I was friends with Leonard, his son. So I was out there at that. And I remember, you know, now that you mention it, I remember those buildings. I'm going to have to go back and revisit that, see if they're still there. That's interesting, Dale. Do we have any other questions? Oh, Pat, you have to unmute yourself. Pat, raise your hand. I'm unmuted, I guess. Hi there. Um, my question is, um, I went to school in Carson City in the old schoolhouse that was across from Brewery Art Center. That was made from uh, sandstone from the prison too, wasn't it? You know, you would perhaps know better than me. I've, I'm basically confused about that. I've wondered about that myself in the past. Um, my mother-in-law was, was, grew up here in Carson City and she could not tell me um but but there are some old photographs that kind of give evidence that that looked like prison sandstone uh, but i would never been able to confirm that um uh, i never did you know again looking at those old newspaper things you know they they talk a lot about construction you know there's a lot of stuff in there about the orphan's home and the capital and the capital annex but i haven't run across anything that talks about the construction of the school um i might go back and revisit that and maybe uh, do my search algorithms a little differently and see if it pops up thank you okay do we have any other questions no one else has their camera on. It's just the five of you. <laughs> well, thank you all very much for listening in on the Francis Humphrey Lecture Series. And thank you very much, Glenn, for coming out and uh, doing this presentation. Um, so like I said, it is recorded. And so it will be posted on the Nevada State Museum Carson City YouTube channel. Um, and, you know, you can tell your friends they need to watch it because you they didn't log on or whatever. Uh, I do have the information for the March Francis Humphrey Lecture Series. Um, for the March Francis Humphrey Lecture Series on the website. So if you're interested, you can go in, and uh, reserve your space for that now. Um, I'm, you know, getting a little ahead now, you know doing it on time. Um, anyway, uh, if you have any questions or, you know, want to say anything, I'm going to hang out a bit, but uh, that was our presentation.